So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Han from uh, Seoul, Korea, and he's going to talk about his experience with laparoscopic liver resection for hepatocellular carcinoma in cirrhotic patients. Ten-year single center experience. Dr. Han, thank yeah. you very much. Thank you for coming. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. David Yanidi and the Pubi uh, Parik. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is a great honor for me to speak for this scientific session of HPV, uh, HPV surgery. Uh, first of all, Dr. David Yanidi and I have been uh, attending the first uh, Laplace River Resection Consensus Meeting in Kentucky Louisville about five years ago, five or six, seven years ago. But I think uh, after seven years, uh, this surgery has very much developed. Uh, so uh, I'd like to talk about our uh, experience of this surgery for HCC and she erotic patient. Uh, I have nothing to disclose. Uh, liver resection in COT patients uh, report to have a higher morbidity and mortality rate compared to non COT patients. Uh, there is a recent acceptance of laparoscopic approach in liver surgery. However, there are few reports uh, uh, evaluating lap liver resection for HCCC in COT patients. Uh, our objective is to evaluate 10 years single center experience of lab liver resection for HCC and compare perioperative and long term outcomes between patients with or without liver cirrhosis. Uh, 232 patients were retrospectively reviewed uh, for HCC uh, for our hospital uh, between January 2004 and until December 2013. All the patient underwent lap liver section. Patient to divide into two groups uh, according to their status of liver parenchyme with or without liver cirrhosis. Liver cirrhosis group uh, had 141 patient and also non liver cirrhotic group had 91 patient. Uh, this is the baseline characteristic. Uh, AG is similar and sex. Uh, gender is similar between the two groups, and uh, in a uh, virology, HBV and HCV is higher than uh, liver cirrhotic group uh, compared to non liver cirrhotic group. Uh, about the child class, uh, this is shows child class and albumin, uh, bilirubin, INR, and the liver function test. Uh, as expected, there are differences between the two groups. And about the platelet, uh, there are <coughs> liver cirrhotic group is lower platelet level, and also the ICG level, ICG 15 is also higher in liver cirrhotic group, and AFP level is higher in liver cirrhotic group. About the operative data uh, of a single or multiple region, uh, the liver cirrhotic group has more multiple region, but there is no statistical significance and the site is similar between the two group, and about the, the site, site is similar between two group, and about the size, liposirotic group has a little uh, lesser size compared to non cirrhotic group, and site is lymph node, uh, there are some difference without any uh, statistical significance. Extental resection is uh, uh, naturally minor in liposirotic group because you have to preserve the liver function, and the operation time is similar between the two groups, and blood loss and transfusion and mortality is similar between the two groups. Intraoperatory is similar in between two groups. About the resection margin, a cirrhotic group has narrow resection margin because we try to preserve liver volume as much as possible, but there is no uh, difference between the uh, uh, L0 and L0 versus R1 resection rate. About the satellite, vascular vascular invasion, capsular invasion, there is no difference between the two groups. About the hospital stay, there is no difference between two groups in statistically, and the complication, uh, there is no difference in, uh, in statistical, although there are some difference in the uh, num uh, number. About the Clavian dindo grade creation, very similar, but only mortality uh, during hospital stay occur in uh, two patients in zero to patient, uh, it is 1.4 percent mortality rate, and the, uh, the cause of the cause of the mortality is ALDS 
and multiple organ failure. Uh, this is a long-term outcome. We have followed the patient for 42.3 months in liver cirrhotic group and 44 months in non-cirrhotic group. Recurrence occurred 70 patients in cirrhotic group and 34 patients in non-cirrhotic group. Uh, but the, uh, this is the no difference. I will show the figure uh, at the late next slides. About the mortality occurred 27 patients in cirrhotic group and 13 patients in 14 group, and I also show this data in figure. Uh, this is a disease-free survival rate. Uh, you can see uh, in the table, uh, one year, three year, five year, seven year survival rate. Uh, there are <coughs> seven year survival rate is 32% in cirrhotic group and 50% 50, 50 uh, in non cirrhotic group. Uh, the, as you see, the right side, uh, their figure is separating, but still there is no uh, statistical significance because of the small number of the patients. About the overall, over, so, I'm sorry, this is, uh, uh, this is, um, this is uh, a typographic error. Uh, this overall survival, overall survival, uh, the one year, three year, five year, uh, seven year survival rate is shown in uh, left table. Uh, seven year survival is 70 percent, and cirrhotic group, and the non cirrhotic group, 72 percent. If you look at uh, the right graph of the right side, uh, there is no difference between the cirrhotic group and non cirrhotic group. As you can see, uh, liver cirrhotic patient has small uh, recurrence rate, but uh, because of uh, aggressive, uh, aggressive treatment after recurrence, Overall survival rate uh, is similar between the two groups. In conclusion, as I say, the, this uh, laparotomy resection for HCC is uh, feasible in the patient with liver cirrhosis. Liver resection in cirrhotic patient showed uh, comparable result to non cirrhotic patient in terms of perioperative and long term outcome. However, prospective comparable studies are still necessary to prove the superiority of laparoscopic liver resection for HECC in Shiroti patient. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Professor Han. Um, any questions from the uh, audience? While you guys are thinking about it, I uh, will just ask a, a couple of questions, which would be, first of all, a great experience, a wonderful experience, and thank you for sharing that with us. And it looks like that um, you stratified things by, you looked at uh, child score, uh, didn't really look at MELD score. Did you calculate this all out for MELD score? Actually, uh, we didn't calculate MELD score, just a, just a child view score, yes. Right. And it looks like there was a bit of a difference between the cirrhotics and the non-cirrhotics when it came to margin. There's about a five millimeter margin difference. Yes. Was, and so, but there wasn't any difference in uh, disease-free survival based on that margin difference. So one could potentially argue that you could have even tighter margins on non-cirrhotic patients. Yes, it's a very great question. So as you can see, in our, uh, in our study, we see that the narrow margin uh, in cirrhotic group. I think, uh, uh, as David uh, pointed out, uh, because of narrow margin, recurrence uh, may be attributed to the narrow margin. Uh, we, I, I think uh, it is very difficult to know uh, why the, there is high recurrence rate in the cirrhotic patient. I think uh, there are many uh, multiple factors. Maybe, uh, as David pointed out, the narrow margin may be one of the contributing factors, although there are many uh, factors. Uh, as you, as, you, as you know, the patient with the cirrhotic patient has uh, limited liver function, so we try to dissect uh, as much as, uh, as less as possible. Uh, so we do limited dissection. Mm -hmm. uh, if it is large, we do anatomy dissection. So that's why the margin is very narrow. Mm -hmm. In the uh, non cirrhotic patient, we do some major dissection like right hemipatrimony. That's why there are differences between margins. So, as uh, David pointed out, we have to find out what uh, has contributed to uh, high recurrence rate in the cirrhotic group. I think it's a good question. And then finally, obviously, we're looking at the difference between complication rates and outcomes for uh, liver resections in cirrhotic and non-cirrhotic patients. And these are well-selected cirrhotic patients. Did you stratify complication rate based on child score? And I need to do MELD score. So was there a higher complication rate in the child B or even child C's? 
Because uh, most of them were all child's A. Yes, uh, it's, a, it's a, another good question. So I think, uh, as you expect, if the patient has poor liver function, uh, I think complication rate increase. So uh, because the, the, the number of COT patients is not large enough, so we, uh, maybe uh, we didn't stratify. But sure. if it has uh, enough uh, number of patients, I think it's a good idea. And you do such wonderful surgery. The complication <laughs> rate is low. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And finally, Thank it you. looked like your disease-free survival of five years was 79% yes. in both groups, but overall survival curve split. Yeah. And so were there more liver-related deaths or liver disease-related deaths for, that affected the overall survival since the disease-free survival was the same? Uh, overall survival, uh, yes. Overall survival the same and disease-free survival separate. I think, it, it was, I think you showed the opposite. Yes, because, the, sorry for the yeah. error. But uh, uh, in our study, uh, uh, disease-free survival was separate, overall survival was same, so 70%. Gotcha. So uh, I don't know why uh, the overall survival is similar, because the recurrence is higher in the group. Uh, but uh, if we uh, try to explain, uh, I don't know, this is no uh, based on the ground, but uh, it can say that uh, we are doing uh, very much aggressive treatment at the recurrence, so that's why the, the survival rate between the serotic group and non serotic group is similar between, yeah. Well, Professor Han, thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. So our, our next speaker is Ahmad Mirza, from, coming from the Mahlines District. General Hospital in Scotland, and the papers on fluoroclangiography, uh, reincarnation, and laparoscopic surgery. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. The laparoscopic era, we have seen a gradual decline of intraoperative glangiography being performed during routine laparoscopic cholecystectomy. The aim of our study was to evaluate uh, the routine use of IOC for patients undergoing elective and emergency laparoscopic cholecystectomy at a single unit. And we wanted to evaluate the subsequent management and outcome of these patients. Uh, we evaluated uh, roughly 4,000 patients from a single center um, who underwent intraoperative glangiography. Uh, we performed common bile duct exploration either through transcystic approach or direct quality dichotomy at the same time. We evaluated the preoperative, operative, and postoperative findings from these patients and their long term follow outcome. We used the standard four port technique uh, and using SIAM for uh, clan geography. We used a three French ureteric catheter to perform IOC. Uh, and you can see that we are using uh, the right upper quadrant five millimeter port to introduce uh, the ureteric catheter. And you can see uh, a beautiful uh, picture of cystic duct being cannulated uh, to perform an IOC. <laughs> uh, and the biliary anatomy uh, fully delineated uh, following uh, the insertion of the calendrogram catheter. 
Uh, we recommend that if the initial uh, urotary catheter failed, you can use cholangiography clamps uh, to achieve a successful IOC. Um, we also recommend that if there is high suspicion of patients to have common bile duct stones to do, perform a direct common bile duct puncture. Our preoperative data shows uh, that there were predominantly female population. Uh, patients who were having common bile duct exploration were older age group as compared to patients who didn't have common bile duct stones. Uh, and uh, that's the result from our 4,000 patients series from single unit. Uh, we had successfully performed 90% 90, 90 of intraoperative cholangiographies. Um, we had a failure rate of 1%. Um, and we also were not able to perform IOCs in 6% of the population. It's, it's, a, it's the largest series uh, from my country um, and, uh, and the largest series for common bile duct explorations. Uh, we have performed more than 800 uh, common bile duct explorations and six, uh, successfully removed stones uh, through transistic approach in more than 60% of the cases. In uh, 40% roughly, we have to perform a direct cholidichotomy. I would also like to mention here that um, we use T-tubes uh, in only 69 cases of the whole series. We were either able to do uh, a transistic drainage uh, following cholidichotomy or were able to primarily close uh, the cholidichotomy using interrupted vicral sutures. That's the um, intraoperative cholangiographic uh, abnormal findings that we had. Um, and you can see that there were dilated ducts, filling defects, strictures, and abnormal ductal anatomy. Now, if we look at the patients who underwent an IOC with no known risk factors for common bile duct stones, uh, we found that 5% of these patients had common bile duct stones, which were cleared intraoperatively. So we were doing a single session management for these patients. I would also like to highlight here that even if the patients had uh, known risk factors for common bile duct stones, like jaundice, acute cholangitis, the, the routine practice at our unit is not to perform a preoperative MRCP or ERCP, unless these patients have been transferred from another hospital uh, where both these procedures have been performed. If you look at the, uh, the, uh, the timing uh, of uh, each um, step during the IOC, um, because we do it routinely uh, and we do it day in, day out, we have been successful, we have been able to reduce the operative time for all steps, including the involvement of the radiographers. Uh, if you look at the operating time between patients undergoing uh, simple cholecystectomy or cholidichotomy and transistic exploration, we can actually see that, of course, um, patients who are having a cholidichotomy are going to have prolonged operative time as compared to patients undergoing laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Um, by uh, adopting a single session management approach, we have been able to do uh, cost saving, um, and our annually we are saving about roughly a uh, million dollars um, on patients who are not being subjected to a routine MRCP or, or preoperative ERCP. Now, this is the most important slide. It's an unpublished data from our unit. Uh, we have uh, surveyed 242 hospitals in the UK uh, last year, uh, between 2013 and 2014, and we found uh, that uh, uh, roughly 30% of the hospitals in our country are performing routine intraoperative cholangiography, um, and this has been the pattern for the last 20 years in those hospitals. 16% uh, of the hospitals in where, uh, the, since, since the introduction of the laparoscopic era, um, and uh, preoperative MRCP and uh, ERCP becoming more readily available. Um, they have gone actually back to a single session management of doing 16%. Um, uh, this is, uh, the, uh, and, and the explanation is based on clinical and training grounds uh, where the residents are being trained to perform these procedures uh, routinely and to perform a uh, common bile duct exploration at the same time. Um, in, uh, we, the vascular, in my country, the vascular surgeons, colorectal guys, and the breast surgeons also perform laparoscopic cholecystectomy, um, but uh, they do not routinely do an IOC. And if you look at the surveys of uh, HPV units, um, 16 out of 20 HPV units routinely perform IOC, both in the acute and emergency uh, settings. Um, uh, my conclusion from, my, uh, from, from our uh, study was that IOC is a safe procedure, 
It's only successful if it's per performed routinely. A selective approach leads uh, to decrease in skills. And a person can only perform a common bile duct exploration routinely if he's competent enough to do an IOC and interpret the results from an IOC. Thank you very much. Any questions from the floor? Would you consider pulling colonoscopy on the ones that you couldn't uh, get the stones out or you couldn't complete? Yeah, we, uh, thank you very much for your question. Yeah, we do uh, perform cholidoscopy colido quite routinely, especially in patients. We are unable to get, uh, take the stones out through either basket trolling uh, or dormia basket. And did you uh, do like a sphincterolysis, like uh, with a sphincterotome or a balloon? Sphincterolysis laparoscopically? We, what we tend to do is we do a balloon dilatation uh, if we find a distal stricture, but we don't do the sphincterotome now. Yeah, we do. Yeah, we do a cholidocoscope and we do a dilatation under direct vision. Um, terrific data. <clears throat> so that certainly is a great process that everybody should be replicating in their own institution. Um, common bile duct injuries. Do you have a number by any chance in terms of your rate? Uh, in our series, it's it's uh, from four thousand patients. The common uh, the the, full, the total incidence of common common bile duct injuries were nine cases. Uh, which, which, is, which is very less as compared to you, if you look at the uh, data published internationally. So, uh, you know, I, I, my one question is, I, I think it's fabulous that you've been able to do that many IOCs uh, routinely and be able to do that. My question is, is, are they always needed? Because if you have nine patients that had common bile duct injuries, um, were those patients did they need the IOC or was it just done as part of the routine process that didn't really need it? Uh, see, um, the, um, I, I fully appreciate your question and that's, that's, that's raised several times in the past. The thing is if you don't do a procedure routinely, you get de-skilled. And for, uh, because R is a training center and a teaching center, tertiary level care uh, for biliary surgery. And if we don't do this routinely and don't teach our residents regularly, then things won't be passed down the ladder. Uh, and if, if you're stuck and you're doing it, the procedure, you don't know how to interpret it, you don't know how to proceed to a common bilateral -like exploration following an IOC, uh, then I think you're de-skilled. Last question. Um, did you have any bile duct injuries as a result of common bile duct exploration and also um, how long was your follow-up? Did you look for any strictures, you know, a year out or anything like that? Uh, yep. Yeah. Uh, well, we had a, uh, the, the patients have been followed up for at least a f a 15 years, and 60% of the patients had a follow-up for, for 15 years in our unit. Uh, the stricture rate that we found uh, was 11 cases where the patient had to go for an post-operative ERC, a uh, post-procedure ERCP, whether they presented six months or, or, or years down the line. Um, and as far as the as, as, as far as the incidence of bile duct injury following common bile duct exploration, yes, we had four cases which were specifically to common bile duct exploration uh, injury following CBD exploration. Yeah, those patients. Uh, uh, so uh, what's the, so basically, those patients underwent ERCP. We didn't perform a second operative procedure, but those patients were dealt with ERCP stenting, and they all settled down. Uh, sorry? Uh, uh, it's difficult to recall. Uh, it's, it's a big data, so I would, not be able to, I would not be able to give you that information. Well, Dr. Mirza, thank you very much. Definitely a compelling argument for routine cholangiography. And uh, thank you very much. Thank for you very much. Thank you. All right. Well, our next speaker is Dr. Ma, coming to us from the Sir Run Run Shaw Hospital in Zhejiang University in China. And he's going to talk with us about laparoscopic versus open enucleation for pancreatic neoplasms. Can I take a picture? What do you, uh, what do you mean? We have video. Is is in video? So Sorry. you're going to start off with the video. Uh, it's it's Lindsay. Uh, video. Uh, good, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, <coughs> it's my pleasure to uh, report the laparoscopic and open enucleation for pancreas neoplasm. I'm from Solan Lanxia from China. Next. Uh, this study is supported by the some gland from government. And uh, <coughs> the background is 
and the clergy is the primary procedure for the blind or no gland malignant neoplasm of the pancreas. But until now, the studies compare laparoscopic to open is very limited. The purpose of this study is to compare the <coughs> polyoperative outcome for patients undergoing laparoscopic or open inoculation. And we also evaluated the pancreatic <coughs> function after laparoscopic inoculation. This is from 2001 to 2015 in our hospital. It's performed by uh, four different pancreas surgeons, but the laparoscopy is by me, and the opening is by other three surgeons. <laughs> we come excluding some combined resection, just the inoculation of the pancreas. This is the measure for tumor in the head of the pancreas. Yeah, the tumor is here. Okay, open. And the tumor is here for tail and for head of pancreas. So let's just wait. Here, yeah. This is the male, 49 years old, here, tumor here. We first explore the abdomen and open the <coughs> gastric calling ligament. And uh, this is the head of the pancreas. This is a Helen SMV, and this is a cognization of the duodena and the head of the pancreas. This is the IVC. This is where you can see the tumor, usually under laparoscopic, we can see the tumor. Sometimes we have ultrasound. <coughs> this is after the section, we shoot you. Future, yeah. This, and this is a tumor. The other measure for tumor located in the tail of the pancreas. This is just after six days, he discharged and recovered well. No, other, other video, yeah. Another video. This is for a case, it's a tumor located in the tail of the pancreas. This is spleen, this is stomach. We can see the tumor here. And we, we end the eye to cut the tumor. It's easy and quickly. This is the tumor here. It's okay. This is space. Yeah, sorry. And uh, this is the baseline character is compatible for the case, even the age, BMI, and uh, ASA score, something. And this is a pathology diagnosis is also compatible <coughs> for benign and uh, local tumor. This is the operative outcome. The operation time is more shorter, and the blood loss is lesser, 
<coughs> and this is the post-operative outcome. This patient recover quickly in laparoscopy group, and the completion is comparable. <coughs> this is a panclick function when they follow up, how it's compatible. So the conclusion is laparoscopic enucleation for panclick tumor is safe and feasible, and compared to open laparoscopic enucleation, have the shorter operation time, low blood, <coughs> blood loss, and the fast recover, and the function is preserved as the open. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Dr. Mo. Any questions from the audience? We have one in the back here. A couple. Everybody's jumping up. Hang on. It's okay. very interesting. Um, oh. From the start of your bowel function, it says average time for lap laparoscopy is about two and a half days, yeah. but your date of discharge was about eight days. Yeah. Why were they staying so, so much longer once the bowel function resumed? Do you have a process where they stay on liquids for six days and then you send them home, or could they not go home on day three, day four? Because it seems like you can decrease that hospital length of stay significantly, even from just your slides alone. Uh, usually for laparoscopic, uh, <coughs> it is have less pain and the patient recover more quickly than the open ear. Yeah. Just to help answer that question for him, you know, in the United States, length of hospital stay is very important. Once you get outside the United States, it's a whole different set of dynamics that contribute to length of hospital stay, which might not correlate with uh, how we do business in the U.S. Uh, feel, feel free to introduce yourself, by the way, Sorry. if you ask a question. Yeah, I'm Mark Mezzo from Chicago. Thank you very much for sharing the sure. experience. Thank it was great. So There's a quick question. I, I think that, especially the video on that laparoscopic enucleation yeah. of the uncinate was very impressive. Yeah. Are you routinely placing drains in either laparoscopic yeah. or open, and what were your fistula rates? Yeah, yeah. You routine put the JP challenge. Uh, usually, just uh, when less than challenge, less than 40 milliliter, <coughs> we pour out. Yeah. I believe in his yeah. uh, publication here, yeah. or the abstract, there was no yeah. difference in the fistula rates of grade yeah. B fistulas, 15% versus 11.5% with no yeah. Yeah. P value. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, yeah. finally, just um, yeah. you yeah. experienced uh, 39 patients over 12 year experience. Yeah. And so was there a difference in the distribution of lap versus open over the course of the 12 years? Yeah. Uh, and was there any selection between yeah. how some, why someone got a lap versus an open procedure? Okay. Uh, because this is a longer time, so uh, the patient no difference when, when the year of time, but uh, just the usual by sex as the doctor, just the laparoscopy is by me and the open is by other three doctors. Yeah. Okay. Is that a question? And then finally, uh, uh, yeah. on your technique videos, you showed uh, yeah. uh, um, uh, harmonic energy versus stapling in both. Yeah. Uh, do you do routine intraoperative ultrasound to look at the lesion relative to the pancreatic duct? And if it's close, do you do any routine preoperative pancreatic duct stenting? Oh, yeah. Usually, we decide by first before surgery, we evaluate it by MRCP and the location of the tumor. Usually, what we find in the surface of the pancreas, we don't routine intraoperative ultrasound. Uh, sometimes when the, it's too close, or sometimes just the very little, yeah. Okay, well, Professor Mao, thank, thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank it. you so thank much. You. Okay. Our next presentation is by Dr. Horatio Ashburn, a video of laparoscopic excision of a type one cholidococyst, including intrapancreatic portion with a Holy doco duodenotomy reconstruction. Thank you very much. Thanks for giving us the opportunity to um, share our technique in uh, intrapancreatic colidocal cysts. I'm in a representation of Tatiana Hoyos, who is a uh, resident in surgery, and she, when she rotated with us, was uh, the one that uh, prepared the, the video, as well as uh, in representation of my partner, Dr. John Stoffer. Um, let's start with my presentation, please. Should I dance then? Because singing, singing, there's no hope. <laughs> what is the pin for? The pin? Yeah. Does anybody know what this pin is? Please, let's just see. Raise hands 
how many people knows what this is? It's a sophisticated audience here. Okay, this is no bowel duct injuries. For, um, let me just pitch it since you asked. Hey, we're all impatibiliary surgeons. That's we don't correct. mind them. Right. That, that is correct, yes. <laughs> now, it, it, it is obvious that we don't expect that um, no one would have a complete zero incidence of bile duct injury, but the goal is to try to decrease it. I don't know how many of you were uh, on the session yesterday, on the bile duct injury session. Can you raise your hands? The majority then. For those that weren't there, basically SAGES has uh, created a task force um, uh, to assess how can we influence um, the techniques of laparoscopic cholecystectomy with a culture of safety to decrease the number of bile duct injuries. That uh, task force has representation from the AHPBA, that it is the American Hepatopancreatic Biliary Association, America's Hepatopancreatic Biliary Association, and also we're in conversations with the International Hepatobiliary and Pancreatic Association to try to see if um, this can be expanded further. Um, the reason for it is because even though the incidence of bile duct injury is not that much, it's around 0.5% in laparoscopic cholestectomy, it's higher than what it was for the open one. And, uh, one says, well, what is 0.5%? But the reality is it's probably around 2,800 to 3,000 patients a year in the United States that have a major bile duct injury. And then that's the, why we're doing that. The Scottish um, incidence over 4,000 was a 0.2%, so not, not bad. How yeah, are we doing back there, good. fellas? You have my computer as a backup, too. Do you want us to switch to the next presentation so yeah, we can keep things we, moving why along? Why don't we get the next yeah. presentation? Right. Dr. Cornetis available and uh, ready to present? Okay, wonderful. Okay, well, we're gonna move on to the next presentation if you guys are ready back there. Um, uh, Dr. Cornetis from the hospital GEA uh, is gonna talk to us about laparoscopic hepatic ojejunostomy after bile duct injury. Or perhaps through this initi uh, initiative, we might be putting him out of business. Oh, and he's actually wearing the pin, too. <laughs> of course. Seems like a conflict of interest. We're against the uh, bad luck injury. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we, we thank St. Jesus for giving us the opportunity uh, to be here. I'm uh, Dr. Adolfo Quendis. Uh, we want to share the work that we have done the last few years. It's a very hard work, and as you know, in Mexico, we have a big problem with bad luck injuries, and only a few referral centers for the reconstruction of these patients. Uh, we present our experience as the first center in, in, minimal, in offer minimal invasive treatment for the common bad luck injury in our country. This is the work we done, uh, the laparoscopic hepatic ionostomy after bile duct injury. Can, can we run the presentation, please? Okay, the, the scenario of the common bile duct injury is, um, is a life-threatening uh, condition with not only medical but economic and legal uh, implications. This patient should be ideally sent to a referral center for the treatment an experienced and multidisciplinary team that includes radiologists, endoscopists, and surgeons. So um, the ideal of the reconstruction should, should meet some goals, uh, be a, a, a room wire reconstruction, a height reconstruction, tension-free, side-to-side, section of the liver segments 3B, 4B, uh, 3, uh, 4B and or 5, if needed, to lower the plate and be able to, to perform a, a nice anastomosis between among well vascularized uh, biliary epithelium and intestinal mucosa. By now, I need my presentation. No, sir. <laughs> okay, this, it's okay. There we go. Okay. To where you left there. Okay, we have nothing to disclose. We already see this. Okay, um, bilinteric laparoscopic diversions have to prove uh, to be safe and feasible on multiple reports, even thought cases after bile duct injury are very small series, or even case reports, anecdotic reports. Um, the laparoscopic approach offers well and applied demonstrated benefits. Magnification and high definition images offered by uh, the lar laparoscope replace the use of loops. And to be honest, uh, it's not easy and requires experience in open reconstruction 
uh, plus advanced laparoscopic and endoscopic skills. This is our technique we use for ports. This is our optical port. This is the site of insertion for the catheter of cholangiography. In this uh, very short video, initially you will see an Strasberg E4 with uh, uh, injury, with right hepatic artery injury after conversion for hemostasis of this patient. You see there this artery injury. This is the confluence of the hepatic injury. Uh, in the postoperatory 11 day, the patient was sent to our hospital. Once drained the cavity, the bile duct is located and cholangiogram is performed until complete hepatic biliary tree is demonstrated. Section of the hepatic segment 4B and 3 to expose some longitudinal incise and the left conduct is performed. In this case, a neoconflex is built in order to do only one biliary anastomosis. It's a built and a ruined way reconstruction and side-to-side -side anastomosis is performed with separate data stitches of absorbable monofilament and extracorporeal sliding nuts. The blind, uh, the blind end of the biliary loop is pexiated beneath the subcephaloid port as an access loop for endoscopic treatment in cases of future stricter. In a two-year period, a prospective uh, study was included all the patients uh, with major baldock injury who were treated in our hospital. Um, 26 referred from other institutions and three injuries inflicted in our hospital. Uh, this is the approach uh, to our patients. We always start with a triphasic CT scan and to establish collections and associated vascular injury. It's available, uh, we perform a cholangiogram uh, resonance, and once the patient has a multidisciplinary consultation, she's taken to the operating room, and according to the general conditions of the patient, the team chooses between laparoscopic hepatic or or uh, in interval sur sur definitive surgery in just during the the, the, the patient. In a two-year period, the pros um, uh, I'm sorry, the demographics of our population is similar to the previous reported uh, series with 82% of females. Two patients with a very uh, previous attempt of repair. We used the classification proposed by Dr. Strasberg for baldock injury. We have three patients with C-type and um, between E1 and E2, eight cases. Uh, an injury uh, at or above the confluence in 18 cases representing the 61% of our series. Here we can see ca how the diagnosis was made by the referrer. Intraoperative recognition was at 51% of the cases. Also, you can see the time passes from the cholecystectomy to the diagnosis of baldock injury and the days from the baldock injury to the laparoscopic hepatic ionostomy. Uh, the Baldock uh, uh, caliber averaged five millimeters. We perform a neoconfluence in all E4 cases and hepquinol-like technique uh, reconstruction in the rest of the patients. Hepatic segment section 3B or 4 and or 5 was done in 10 cases and we have one ca case of conversion. The average surgical time was 240 minutes with a bleeding of 200 milliliters on set of oral intake in two days. Hospital stays eight days and there were no related deaths in the maximum follow-up and the time is uh, 36 months. This is our complications. We have five by leaks, which solved without our intervention that just must take the drainage for a week. Uh, two patients were reoperated to a Peterson's hernia, another because um, a leakage of uh, hepatic ionostomy and bilioma, uh, just drainage was needed. Until now, all the patients remain asymptomatic. Uh, one case of percutaneous endoscopic dilatation after stricter uh, that's present 18 months later of the laparoscopic hepatic ionostomy for a symptomatic cholestasis uh, was needed. Uh, laparoscopic approach for the baldock injury repair is safe and feasible. We know that this is an, an initial report with a menu term follow-up and uh, should grow in number of cases. But we expect the results that will be equally satisfying in a long-term basis since we are using the same principle that have already proved successful in billiard reconstruction. Thank you very much. Excellent work, and I want to congratulate you on the uh, technical uh, mastery of being able to do a laparoscopic hepatogogegenostomy. One of the questions that I had for you is that, well, in general principles, and I wasn't clear on the timing of your reconstruction, so uh, you said that there is an average time between um, uh, the 
injury and the reconstruction was 11 days. Yeah. But I'm not sure what the distribution is there because we would think, most people I think would say is either you reconstruct them in the first two, three days, then you get into that inflammatory phase or you reconstruct in a delayed fashion six or eight weeks later. So I'm not sure what that 11 days actually represents. And is there a two different modes of timing of reconstruction? Yeah, we, we, we divided the, the, the reconstruction in three times. The acute uh, reconstruction, who is, who is the one who performed in the first, uh, in the first week, and then the, uh, the reconstruction that we, the, we perform in the first six weeks and then after. Um, only three cases we have that uh, requires uh, an interval and delayed um, uh, reconstruction. The, most of the patients have reconstruction in the, in the first six weeks. Do, we have just a few cases of in acute reconstruction that uh, the surgeon who, who, who has the problem uh, talk to us in, in the transoperatory uh, uh, scenario and we go and reconstruct those, those patients in the very same day. So say they're out five days, seven days from their injury. You'll reconstruct that at that time uh, point? The first, the, the most of the patients are in the, first, uh, in the first week. In the first week? Yeah. Okay, wonderful. I mean, it's a very uh, strong experience. I want to congratulate you for your work. Any questions from the uh, audience regarding this? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Job. Excellent. Excellent job. I think, Doc, are they running? Okay. Right. Well, back by popular demand is the infamous <laughs> Dr. Aspen from the Mayo Clinic in Florida. Yeah. Thank you very much again. <laughs> Yes, now we have it. Thank you. As I stated, I'm um, in representation of uh, Tatiana Hoyos and uh, John Stoffer and uh, their co-author is uh, Dr. Frank Lukens. Thank you very much for the opportunity to share our presentation. Uh, Cholerocal cysts are cystic dilatations of the biliary tree, usually are more frequent in females, and uh, typically they present in childhood. However, they can present almost at any age. 20% of the patients, the diagnosis may be delayed until adulthood. Uh, the cholerocal cysts are classified in five different types. Uh, this is a drawing from the liver volume of the American, Atl American College of Surgeons Atlas of Surgery. And you have the five different types. Uh, the most common ones are type one, as well as type four. And if we do the subclasses of these two, you have a type 1A, type 1B, and type 1C. These three correspond to 70 to 80% of all cholidocal cysts. And the subclasses of type 4 are shown there, type 4A or type 4B. Type 4 includes the uh, intrahepatic biliary tree. And these are around 12 to 18%. But again, the large majority are type 1. The surgical options on patients that have um, the intrapancreatic extension of the cholidocal cyst. Number one is just leave the portion of the intrapancreatic cyst in place. However, that may defeat the purpose of trying to take this out to prevent a development of a malignancy. Because the main reason to take these uh, patients to surgery is either because of symptoms, but also because of the fact that they can develop a malignancy. The other option, which is the most common one, is to go ahead and do a pancreatic or duodenectomy. And this is what it's most standard. However, many of these patients get to surgery when the lesion is still benign or early premalignant. Therefore, pancreatic or duodenectomy may be a little bit too much of a, of a uh, surgery for these patients. The third option is to actually remove the cyst with complete preservation of the pancreatic head. We did this um, for the first time when a patient who was a physician they came and asked us to see if we could develop other options. Little we know, this had been described before, not laparoscopically, but it had been described before several years. Then uh, the case we present here is one of five cases we have done with excision of the intrapancreatic portion of the common bile duct preserving the pancreatic head. When one has to be very careful, particularly if it is going to preserve the pancreatic head, is to make sure that there is not an anomalous pancreatic or biliary ductal junction. And therefore, preoperatively, you need to do imaging studies that are of good quality for you to assess this. 
because if not, you will damage the pancreatic duct. Traditionally, one of the theories of the reason why cholerocal cysts develop is an abnormal pancreatic biliary junction. Therefore, if you have this and you come trying to preserve the, uh, the pancreas, you will injure this. If the junction is normal, then you can peel off the whole bile duct of the pancreatic head. Then this is our position of the trochers, and I'm going to present now our case presentation. This was a 17-year-old female uh, with a 12-month history of intermittent episodes of sharp right upper quant pain and symptoms of gallbladder disease. There was no significant past medical surgery, his surgical history. Is the video going? Can you click on the video, please? Then the patient, obviously at that age, was, diagnosed, was worked up for possible uh, biliary disease and an ultrasound uh, showed a focally enlarged common bile duct. CT confirmed the presence of a focally enlarged um, biliary tree. An MRI shows very clearly that the bile duct on this patient is normal up to the interpancreatic, distal interpancreatic portion. In fact, the first part of the interpancreatic portion was more or less well, and above the pancreas, the biliary T is completely normal. This makes it a 1-3-B. The procedure is started by mobilizing the um, the hepatic flexure of the colon. This is the duodenum. This is the hepatic flexure of the colon. Then we go ahead to the hepatoduodenal ligament. Uh, the trick here is basically to open the seroadipose tissue on top of the hepatoduodenal ligament. You see that it's very nice, non-inflamed. Uh, we proceed with the, um, with the mobilization of the duodenum through a coker maneuver. This is done very readily laparoscopically without difficulty. We are going to expose the, um, the vena cava. Again, the nice part of these cases is that the majority don't have a huge amount of inflammation around this area because the problem is interpancreatic. Now you have the pancreatic head posteriorly. We continue the dissection. This is the common bile duct. Now the camera, and this is the portal vein. You can see that if you put the camera on the right side, you can readily have uh, access, you can have uh, readily access to the area of the hepatoduodenal ligament. This is the proximal common bile duct, and you can see that, again, the bile duct appears to be um, uh, quite normal on this area. We continue the dissection. Portal vein is seen here. This is the hepatic artery. On this case, now we go towards the, um, the area of the gallbladder. We traditionally take the gallbladder out in regular fashion. And the decision is how much of the extrahepatic biliary tree we want to take out. This patient is 17 years old. This looks completely normal. Then a decision was made not to take the whole extrahepatic biliary tree. Somebody may argue, well, you know, the, the, these pre, are, pre, uh, are precursors of cancer. You should take it all out. But in 1-3-V, that's not that clear. Now you see the pancreatic head. We have found that using this, uh, uh, this kidner, it's very helpful pushing the pancreatic parenchyma. And once you get into the plane, this is not a difficult operation. You just need to apply traction on this direction, and you take very small bites with a harmonic scalpel. Little by little, you're going to develop a crevice within the pancreas. Here, there's a lymph node close to the portal vein that is taken for sample. And now we continue the dissection. We learned laparoscopically that really the, pain, the common bile duct doesn't go through the pancreas. The pancreatic parenchyma surrounds, hugging. But as you can see, we're not getting into pancreatic parenchyma. You can see here the crevice that this is left. We have arrived almost to the duodenum. We put a clip and divide. This is a dilated portion of the biliary tree. The reconstruction normally is done on a hepatic or jejunostomy fashion. Very rarely we do a cholidoco duodenostomy. Um, in this case, the cholidoco duodenostomy was done. 
And the anastomosis is the routine anastomosis we do for um, the hepatobiliary reconstruction laparoscopically. By using the bulldogs, we prevent um, leakage. And then we, have, we use a suture that we borrow from um, eye surgery. This is a Vicral 5.0 with a TF needle. This is what we use for our, our uh, pancreatic duodenectomies, the hepatic jejunostomy too. Our uh, scrubners, if they like you, they color it because this is, since it's ophthalmologically, they usually don't come colored and they just grab one of the, pen, the pencils and, and color it black and that way we can see it better. The, um, <coughs> the, this is Vicrol. We do a running suture. We use this needle driver that we have had it adapted for us. It's really a three millimeter needle driver um, that we put uh, a five millimeter shaft on it. Um, the, this allows us for very fine reconstruction and it allows us to move the needle in many different angles to be able to place the stitch in whatever way we want to place the stitch. This again is our routine, um, routine uh, colidoco duodenostomy. A lot of people says, well, this is just possible only for a few people. I don't believe that. I think that if you put the effort, you can do this anastomosis without a significant difficulty once you learn them. And that is the colidoco duodenostomy. We put a drain and then we anchored the, the bowel just to avoid any traction to the area of the gyrotus fascia. And with that, we completed. This is the colidocal cyst was negative for malignancy. Thank you very much. Patient had an eventful postoperative course and went home in three days. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Aspen. Uh, just a t first of all, a magnificent video. Uh, nice BMI of uh, 15, 20? Was yeah. Probably 20, <laughs> 25. Um, yes. One of, one of the, uh, it from Asia. the traditional way, uh, one of the traditional ways of doing a colidocal cyst resection would be from the inside. So you have the, the cyst open and you dissect down to the junction of the pancreatic duct. That's one technique. And so you take it down to the pancreatic duct junction coming at it purely from the outside, do you ever see the pancreatic duct coming in? And if you're gonna to continue to come in from the outside, is there any value in preoperatively placing a pancreatic duct stent so you take it down to the stent? Uh, we haven't done a preoperative pancreatic um, stent. I think that it could be a good idea. The only question would be, would we be risking uh, pancreatitis on this? Um, I don't know. Okay. I think that it's a, a, a poten potentially it's a pretty good idea. The advantage we have is, um, we have extremely good support at the institution that I work in Mayo Clinic, Florida. And then our radiologists, we have three radiologists that they do MRI uh, of the pancreas and liver. Then we can see the junction imaging pretty well beforehand. I would assume and that if in the case we have any doubts that we're going to get close to that, then we would now use the pancreatic uh, duct stent. Thanks for your idea. Thank you. Well, Dr. Hahn? Yes, uh, Dr. Christian has been. I congratulate for your very excellent uh, video and your technique is very good. So, and your tips of using 3 meter is very important. So, so is that the commercially available in? Um, the, the, it is not a commercially available. I'm not a good businessman, probably I should, but actually um, because we don't have a good similar instrument to grab the needles, what we're doing is we're developing a sleeve to put over any three millimeter instrument. And that we're doing, um, and again, I have no disclosures because I'm not receiving any money from it. Um, but uh, hopefully that's going to come to fruition and we're going to be able to do it. Yes, I think so. And uh, as Dr. Ioannidi already mentioned, I think uh, the problem of whole cystic in pancreas uh, has uh, some risk of pancreas injury. So you, as you have said, I think uh, is there any, any way of avoiding pancreas doctor injury during your dissection? I, I think the main way to avoid a pancreatic duct injury is to try to study it well preoperatively. And if you have any doubts that the, the junction is abnormal, then you have to 
think, well, should I just do a Whipple or can I still save this? And let me just stop here for a second. Professor Han from Korea is probably one of the people in the world that has the most experience in colloidal cysts. You have published a significant number of colloidal cyst resections. Then I just want to say that on the audience, and I'm honored by your questions. <laughs> Thank you. Last nice question. Thank you. Luis Fernandez from Mexico. Uh, thank you for a wonderful video, Dr. Osmond. My question is, do you trust intracystic amylase levels in order to leave an incomplete cyst resection? Intracystic amylase levels? Yeah. I'm not sure, I'm not familiarized with trying to get the intracystic amylase levels. Okay, thank you. Mean, uh, you mean to try I mean, to assess I've, I've where the pancreatic duct joins I've, I've, the cyst? I've heard in other congresses that uh, high levels of amylase intracystic uh, uh, numbers uh, have a relation with the posterior development of cancer. That is okay. the big question in the colloidal cyst. So, some people in Argentina recommend to have these levels measured in order to know if there's an anomaly in the uh, pancreatic uh, confluence no, and no. to decide whatever to do with the cyst, if you can leave it incomplete, proximal or distal and things like that. Yeah, no, that now I understand um, uh, better. Thank you. I apologize. I didn't understand before. Um, the, that goes with the theory that the reflux of pancreatic juice towards the biliary tree is the source of, uh, pink, of um, uh, the potential future cancer on the biliary tree. I have not used intracystic uh, uh, amylase level and, uh, until then. Thank you. Thank you. Right. For the sake of time, I'm, I apologize, but we need to move forward because the session, we have one minute. We want to give uh, courtesy. Thank Dr. You. Aspen, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. So our last uh, presentation is the first decade of laparoscopic pancreatic oduodenectomy in the United States, costs and outcomes using the nationwide inpatient sample presented by Dr. Tran from Stanford University. Thank you for the opportunity to present our research on the first decade laparoscopic pancreatic duodenectomy using a nationwide inpatient sample. We have no disclosures. Laparoscopic pancreatic duodenectomy is an extremely complex operation that requires considerable expertise. Our understanding of this procedure has been limited to a single institution case series. The question remains, is laparoscopic Whipple justified? Proponents of this procedure argue that it is associated with a shorter length of stay, improved morbidity, and decreased blood loss. However, critics of this procedure argue that it is an extremely complex operation that is often associated with longer operative time the oncologic equivalence remains unproven and is associated with a, quite a high surgical cost. So we sought to answer the question, what is the U.S. experience of laparoscopic Whipple? We used a nationwide inpatient sample to assess morbidity, mortality, and total hospital charges in patients who underwent laparoscopic Whipple from 2000 to 2010. High-volume hospitals were defined as those hospitals that perform more than 20 pancreatic resections of any kind. This was previously defined in literature on the on volume outcomes relationship. We identified 1,186 hospitals. More than six, uh, nearly 16,000 Whipples were performed during the last decade. Of those, 681, sorry. 681 cases were performed laparoscopically. This consisted of 4.4% of the entire cohort. We first evaluated outcomes between open and laparoscopic cases. In this table, you can see that patients underwent laparoscopic Whipple tended to be slightly older. The comorbidities were fairly similar, with the exception of diabetes. Not surprisingly, Laparoscopic Whipples were more commonly performed in high-volume hospitals, particularly hospitals that perform, that perform a high volume of any kind of pancreatic resection. As far as post-operative outcomes, laparoscopic Whipples were associated with a lower morbidity, lower rates of pulmonary complications, decreased need for blood transfusion, shorter length of stay by one day, Mortality and, median and hospital charges were similar. 
we next evaluated uh, um, outcomes based on hospital volume. Um, this table shows the preoperative characteristic of patients underwent laparoscopic um, whipples stratified by hospital volume. Again, high volume hospitals were, tho were those that perform a high number of pancreatic resections. <clears throat> if you look at post-operative outcomes in patients underwent laparoscopic pancreatic or duodenectomy, these pa uh, patients who had whipples perform high volume hospitals were associated with lower morbidity, decreased pulmonary complications, decreased length of stay, mortality rates were slightly lower in the high volume group, and the hospital charges were $30,000 lower in the high volume group. This figure illustrates um, the distribution of laparoscopic cases performed in the last 10 years as stratified by hospital volume. As you can see, Re purple represents high volume and green represents low volume. Hi uh, laparoscopic whipples performed in high volume institutions tended to be skewed towards the left. They cost much less compared to hospitals performing, uh, sorry, whipples perform high low volume hospitals. These case cases tend to have a wider variation in charges. Um, so this bar graph shows only hospitals that performed any laparoscopic whipples in the last 10 years. As you can see, um, laparoscopic whipples, which is represented in red, really represents a very tiny fraction of any uh, of laparoscopic uh, whipples performed in, uh, in, in these hospitals. Blue represents open whipples. Um, high volume hospitals are portrayed on your right. And you can see there's quite a bit of variation in number of laparoscopic whipples, even in those high volume hospitals. So this raises the question, does one have to do a high number of laparoscopic whipples to have a good outcome? Um, in looking at the uh, NIST database, we identify essentially 15 hospitals that perform more than 50 whipples in the last 10 years. Um, this is represented in the middle bar. These hospitals had a morbidity of 33%. Hospitals that performed lap whipples, um, fewer than 50 lap whipples in the last 10 years, their morbidity was actually about 44%. That being said, laparoscopic whipples perform uh, in hospitals that have a high number of pancreatic ca cases annually. Um, this is shown on the right-hand side. The morbidity appears relatively similar to those 15 hospitals that performed more than 50 whipples in the last 10 years. In a multivariate analysis, we determined that operative approach, lab versus open, was not a significant predictor of mortality. When we look at complications in the laparoscopic cohort, age and comorbidity was not significant. However, hospital volume, those that perform a high number of pancreatic cases, um, hospital volume was associated with improved outcomes, a 30% risk reduction of complications. So in conclusion, despite early in the learning curve, laparoscopic whipple is associated with better outcomes um, than expected in the first decade in the US. There's lower morbidity and shorter length of stay. Hospitals that perform a higher volume of pancreatic operations achieve better outcomes at a lower overall cost than hospitals that perform few pancreatic operations. Laparoscopic whipples performed in hospitals that perform a high volume of pancreatic surgery appears to be safe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you know, I think that the issue of high volume versus low volume centers for pancreatic oduodenectomy has been, you know, pretty well studied and pretty well answered. So we appreciate the fact that you're looking at a big database and you're uh, looking at uh, outcomes, costs, complication rates for open versus lab. But obviously, there's no selection between patients who are undergoing lap versus open. And so are we really comparing apples to apples? And would it be better to have sort of a case matched series so that you can truly compare cost and outcomes? Um, thank you very much for the question. I do agree that there is a significant component of patient selection that this does not uh, have available in its database. Um, in, uh, important variables such as tumor size, you know, um, uh, whether or not the pancreas is soft or hard, these are important um, uh, variables that we don't have uh, in, our current, in our database. 
Thank you. For the um, presentation, and according to your abstract on the APP, CG's APP, I learned that you state that um, the high volume hospitals are associated with the uh, lower risk of mortality. And you know that the different tumor have different um, biological characteristics. So I wonder whether the um, etiology of the um, tumors of the two groups, uh, the low level hospital and high level hospital are similar between, uh, are similar in your study. Um, so we do not have outcomes beyond 30 days. So we cannot determine the oncologic um, efficacy between um, high versus low volume hospitals. Okay, thank you. Right, last question, Dr. Aspen. Yes, uh, nice presentation. Thank you for looking into this. A couple of comments. Um, the, the selection is, is varies according to the experience. Because, for example, once you have done the learning curve, um, the, currently I think the easiest whipples that we have are being done open, except for the main portal vein resections. Uh, because we found out that the laparoscopic approach is better for the obese people and, the, and uh, some of the bigger cases you can see with magnification. My question to you is, how do you, uh, what do you propose to, to assess if um, there should be credentialing and um, regionalization of these cases and how we would do that? And that's a question for Dr. Ayanidi too. Right. That's a loaded uh, question. Well, then, um, <laughs> first of all, it's an honor to have you, um, to have any question asked by you. I read all your papers on this procedure. So thank you very much. Um, so as far as, um, Proposing credentialing, I think one of the uh, parameters we can use to determine whether or not one has achieved um, uh, competency, competency in this procedure is operative time. And uh, naturally, early during a learning curve, it takes much longer to perform such a complex procedure. But as you do, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, um, I imagine the uh, operative time would be much lower. So. Although we don't have a cutoff, um, as wh when, um, how, lo how long of a laparoscopic operation would, uh, if you perform an operation less than, say, four hours, that's indicative that you're very skilled at performing laparoscopic whipples versus those who perform eight to 10 hours. I don't have a cutoff for that. But then that's where a multi-institutional study would be very useful. Um, this has been studied, um, I believe, um, by the Emory group um, in the past. They had published papers using dis uh, on distal pancreatectomy, um, like an operative time oncology equivalence. So I think there's a need to do multi-institutional studies for laparoscopic wobbles. Yeah. And <clears throat> regarding a question regarding regionalization, I'll just say at the end of the day, the uh, economics of healthcare is going to drive that. I want to congratulate all the authors for their uh, fantastic work in presenting. Uh, thank you very much, and I think our session is done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Safe trip. Okay. Thank you. All right, if everyone would just come on in and sit down. And I think we're about ready to get started here. So I am Dr. Stephen Scott, and I'm going to be the moderator of this robotic session here at SAGES. Uh, my co-moderator is Dr. Bispo from uh, Rio, 
And uh, so we have some, I think, very interesting uh, uh, talks today. Hopefully it'll generate some good discussion. It's going to be fairly flexible, just for the presenters to know. It's going to be fairly flexible as far as how long your presentation takes versus questions. So, uh, you know, five to eight minutes is okay for the presentation. We'll have anywhere from two to five minutes for, uh, for questions afterwards. If you have questions afterwards, if you have the app, you can submit them up here. They'll, they'll come up to us up here and we can ask them, or else you can go to one of the microphones there. So, um, and we'll, we'll go from there. Uh, if we could go ahead and get our first uh, presenter, Dr. Boyce will present on public perceptions on robotic surgery, hospitals with robots and surgeons that use them. My name is Josh Boys from the University of Southern California, and like I said, I'll be presenting on our public perceptions of robotic surgery. Uh, one of our authors is a paid instructor for intuitive surgical. Robots were first introduced into the operating room in 1985. These first robots held laparoscopic cameras and retracted. With the introduction of newer robotic systems, such as the Da Vinci system, the robots started to first interact and interface with human tissues, actually cutting and sewing. Since 2000, when the FDA approved the Da Vinci robot, there's been an exponential increase in the number of robotic procedures performed worldwide annually. However, the public perception of robotic surgery is not well known. So our aim was to assess public perceptions of robotic surgery, hospitals that have robots, and surgeons that use them. We performed a web-based survey 24 multiple choice questions with an option for free text on some of the answers. The link was distributed worldwide by email and social media from July to September of 2014, and we excluded surveys for less than 50% survey completion. We excluded four day two surveys, leaving us with 747 for analysis. The mean age was 38 and a half, with the majority being females. 92% had a college degree or higher and 94% of respondents were from the U.S. However, we did have 16 other countries represented in our sample. The occupation of the respondents, 53% were healthcare workers, with 13% being physicians. The others made up a wide variety of occupations. When we asked them about the global perceptions of robotic surgery, the majority, 86%, had heard of robotic surgery and 78% thought it was similar to laparoscopic or minimally invasive surgery. However, 22% did think that robotic surgery was most similar to open, laser, or scarless surgery. And 21% indicated that some degree of autonomy by the robot during surgery was there. 72% of respondents, when asked about advantages of robotic surgery, thought that it was safer, faster, less painful, and or produced better results. However, when we asked them, if you needed surgery versus robotic surgery or conventional minimally invasive surgery, only 45% actually said they would prefer robotic surgery. This discrepancy between these are likely multifactorial. Some of the concerns the respondents had about robotic surgery, the majority thought the robot or were concerned that it could malfunction causing internal damage. And 15% thought the robot actually did the wrong operation. 18% had other concerns. We asked our respondents <clears throat> about hospitals with the robots and robotic surgeons. So worldwide, 50% thought that hospitals with a robot were actually better hospitals. But only 26% thought robotic surgeons were better surgeons. An additional advantage of robotic surgery is its ability to perform remote surgery. So we asked our respondents, if you were having robotic surgery, which would you prefer? A, a world-renowned expert surgeon you've never met operates from a remote location or B, a non-expert you met 
does the surgery on site. 50% chose the expert they had never met to perform the robotic surgery. So in conclusion, most were familiar with robotic surgery and associated with improved outcomes. Less than half would choose to have it over conventional minimally invasive surgery. Misperceptions about robotic surgery are common, indicating the need for public and patient education. And finally, interest in remote surgery should be explored as a potential option for utilizing high volume expert surgeons for complex procedures without having to regionalize care to locations far from the patient's home and support system. Thank you. Uh, any questions from the audience? Um, I have a question to start off with. How much did the demographics shape these opinions? In other words, were there big difference between males and females, or I'm actually more interested in based on the age of the respondents. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we, so one of the advantages of this is that we did have a large enough population that we could do a subgroup analyses. Um, females, interestingly, um, actually had perceived more advantages, but they also had more risk, and they were actually less likely to choose robotic surgery over, over males. Some people might say that that has just <clears throat> might be differences based on the way we weight risk and benefits, but you know, we can't, we need never explore that in this survey. Um, and then by age, um, there are a few differences. The younger age group um, had heard about robotic surgery a little bit more, um, but as far as choosing and some of the other major misconceptions, they're actually pretty even. Okay. Question. Danielle Molina from Baltimore. I'm curious to know if you looked or asked the patients where, since there are not a lot of healthcare worker, where did they get the information about the robot? Where did the perception of what robotic surgery is comes from for patients? Yeah, um, from, you mean from non-healthcare workers? Or yeah, in general, probably, you know, the healthcare yeah. worker, I'm sure they are, you know, yeah. there's a lot of marketing going on. So I'm curious to know what patients that are not, other people that mm -hmm. are not in the healthcare uh, yeah. world, where they heard about the robot. Yeah, we gave them uh, options, you know, a friend, um, television, internet. The top two was someone they knew and the internet. Okay, yeah. that's interesting. <clears throat> yes, sir. Hi, I, I think that's a fantastic study, most needed at this time. There is a, my, my question is more philosophical. There is a sort of an anti robot in the public media, uh, especially look at the New York Times. They've published at least two articles saying that. You know that this is this is not good, and it's costing us a lot. How do you think we should go about changing the perception at that level? Um, from the media, well, you know, there's there's a paper out there by Jen and others uh, that talks about hospital advertising. Um, so you know, there's advances in marketing from the hospital aspect. Um, I mean, the public perception actually, I think, has a relatively favorable perception, and I think we can all agree that most of the people that walk into our offices um, have a pretty low healthcare knowledge in general and really it falls on us to educate them um, and really kind of tackle it when they come to us. Um, there's other things, you know, when you, it, it's, it's just a kind of opens a bag of worms in that sense when you start talk, dealing about marketing and, and stuff like that. So it's really complex, but I think it needs to be addressed. How were the surveys distributed? In other words, was this just a purely local thing? Was it a mail? Was it an internet? How, how was that distributed? Yeah, so um, we sent them out to, we all posted on social media, and then we distributed it um, within our group, and we asked everybody to forward it on to people and asked them to post it on social media sites. So it just kind of took off, and it was nice to get that many responses. All right. Thank you very much. That was, that was tremendous. Thank you. Uh, next, <clears throat> we have uh, Dr. Altieri. Uh, robotic approaches may offer benefit in colorectal procedures, more controversial in other areas. A review of 166,790 cases. Thank you. Uh, we would like to thank uh, SAGES, uh, the SAGES Program Committee, for the opportunity to present our data here today. In addition, we would like to thank Dr. Bispo and Dr. Scott for moderating. 
Um, which one is that? Okay. So we have no relevant disclosures. Since introduction of laparoscopic cholecystectomy in 1988, laparoscopy has gained significant popularity in many surgical specialties. While advancement of minimally invasive surgery has increased significantly in certain areas, its penetration in other specialties remains suboptimal. More recent data from 2008 to 2012 from academic centers showed that penetrance of laparoscopy in colorectal surgery was as low as 52% compared to other areas such as bariatric surgery where it was 94% and anti-reflux procedures where it was 84%. And this is pretty impressive. The use of robotic assisted surgery has been cited as a significant technological advancement in the area of minimal invasive surgery. While the penetrance of robotic surgery into fields of gynecology and urology has been significant, us as general surgeons have been the slower adopters. The purpose of our study was to compare laparoscopic and robotic assisted surgery among five different general surgery pr procedures with various penetrants of minimally invasive surgery. Following IRB approval, the SPARCS database, which stands for the New York Statewide Planning and Research Cooperative System Administrative Database, was used to identify five common general surgery procedures which were performed between 2008 and 2012. Namely, these were cholecystectomy, Roux-en-Y gastric bypass, esophageal fund duplication, colectomy, and sleeve gastrectomy. ICD-9 codes were used to select laparoscopic versus robotic procedures. Procedures were compared based on number of complications and hospital length of stay. Following univariate analysis, propensity score matching was used to estimate the marginal differences between patients who underwent robotic assisted and laparoscopic procedures with p-values less than 0.05 were considered significant. There were 1,458 robotic cases and 165,332 laparoscopic cases. From the robotic case mix, the majority were colectomy, followed by bariatric procedures, esophageal fund duplication, and finally cholecystectomy. Following the varied analysis, to our surprise, um, there were more complications following laparoscopic procedures compared to robotic procedures. However, when we further subdivided into the five categories, they, uh, there was no statistical significance, significant difference uh, in terms of cholecystectomy, Roux-en-Y gastric bypass, sleeve gastrectomy, and esophageal fund duplication. Where the differences lied actually was in the colectomy group where there was a higher rate of complications following laparoscopic procedures compared to robotic procedures. This was significant and impressive. Similarly, following hospital, when we looked at hospital length of stay, colectomy and robotic colectomy had a lower hospital length of stay compared to laparoscopic procedures. As robotic procedures were mean of five days compared to laparoscopic procedures, which were mean of seven days. Next, we perform propensity score analysis. Following propensity score analysis, again, there was a lower rate of complications following robotic procedures compared to laparoscopic procedures. When we looked at two hospital length of stay following propensity uh, analysis, actually there was no difference in hospital length of stay in the colectomy group where the difference in now lay, laid was in sleeve gastrectomy, where robotic surgery now, robotic surgery actually had a higher hospital length of stay compared to laparoscopic surgery with a mean of 1.2 days. So based on these findings, we concluded that robotic assisted surgery exhibited no superiority to laparoscopy in common laparoscopic procedures in terms of complications and hospital length of stay. Robotic approaches may facilitate safer adoption of minimally invasive approaches in areas where penetrance of conventional laparoscopy is low, such as colorectal surgery. Thank you. Uh, again, any questions from the floor? Um, my question is, was there any way of risk adjusting these, uh, these cases at all, or is that beyond the capability of the, of the uh, database? 
Well, we did pr propensity score analysis where we actually case matched, um, so si very similar on all characteristics. Mm -hmm. So patients for the underwent laparoscopic surgery and robotic surgery were matched on most characteristics. Okay. All right. Yes, question. Um, you spend, uh, we, I think in the literature we see a lot of data that shows, compares laparoscopy to robotic surgery and we don't see the difference in the outcomes. I just was wondering if you could uh, comment on the fact that do we need that as, you know, that laparoscopy and robotics being similar outcomes, I think that is a good thing rather than something that we're trying to prove over and over again and, you know, looking at surgeon ergonomics and, and um, fatigability and things like that. I was wondering if you could comment on that aspect of it. Well, what we wanted to do is actually look into um, compare the different procedures that had different penetrance of laparoscopy. So that was our purpose. Uh, it wasn't exactly to compare um, just in terms of outcomes, but our variable was that these are five procedures that have different penetrance of laparoscopy. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you for a great talk, Eric Dustin from UCLA. I just wanted to ask a question about the potential for selection bias when you're looking at these two things because you imagine in, in cases where there's low penetrance of laparoscopy, the only people who are going to jump to the robot are ones who are probably well along on their, on their learning curve for those particular procedures and they feel comfortable enough to try something new. So I wonder if you had any thoughts on that. I'm sure when you were writing up your paper that was one of the things you explained away in the discussion, I suspect. <laughs> It was, and it's Thank actually, uh, my mentor actually commented on that before this talk, we were talking about this. And um, there is, you know, selection, there's a possibility of selection bias. We try to eliminate that as much as possible with the propensity score. Of course, there is no, um, there is no um, way to actually control for that. So we do need some prospective studies to actually evaluate. This. Thank you. Yes, sir. Steve Demeester from USC, very nice presentation. Uh, question for you, do you know what types of complications uh, that occurred in the colorectal group? And then secondly, since they had a shorter hospital stay, there's always the concern that they had a higher readmission rate. There's been linkages between short hospital stays and readmissions. Does the database account for readmissions in colorectal patients that got discharged earlier? Um, so I'll answer actually your first, for your second question first. There is a way to actually look at readmissions, and that's great with the Sparks database. We haven't actually looked into that yet, but that's something that we can easily do. Uh, and your first question was uh, if um, you know the types, of types of complications. So we actually looked into all complications, um, and this ranges from like gastrointestinal complication, which was a little more general, to more serious, such as myocardial infarction, leaks, uh, et cetera. We haven't separated the, them yet, but we, that's something that we can do as well. So, and uh, you know, I also I think one of the difficulties with these studies, of course, is to look at the experience of the surgeons doing these. We would have to assume, I think, that these were amongst the first first robotic cases that these surgeons were performing in these various procedures. Um, so we we didn't look to previous years. Um, there is actually a way to look into. The, the, whether the surgeon has done this because they have their yeah. NPIs in that da database, but we haven't. We, we just concentrated on those two, uh, on those four years. Yeah. Okay. All right. Very good. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so next we have uh, Dr. Prague, who will uh, talk about robotic versus laparoscopic rectal resection for rectal adenoma.